Coming up on Theatre Talk. Look over your shoulder, Laura, and make a wish. What shall I wish for, Mother? Happiness. And just a little bit of good fortune. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And Susan, there is an absolutely first-rate revival of one of the great American plays on Broadway now. The Glass Menagerie, which of course is two of the great roles in uh, American um, uh, dramatic history, Amanda Wingfield and her um, sad daughter, Laura Wingfield. And I don't think you're going to see a better interpretation of these roles, at least I am not in my career, as they are being portrayed now by the great Celia Keenan-Bolger as Laura. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thanks. And uh, one of um, America's greatest actresses, uh, Cherry Jones, who has been brilliant in everything I have seen her in <laughs> and is uh, maybe even better than ever before as Amanda Wingfield in The Glass Menagerie. Thank you. Welcome, ladies. Uh, speaking actor to actor, because you know I'm quite well known now for my appearances on Smash. <laughs> that, <laughs> that really, really dead TV script. <laughs> Which we've been hearing a little bit about <laughs> before we, before we <laughs> begin to take. <laughs> when you, when, you know, when, 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 speaking of professional and professionals, uh, Celia, you're approaching a role that uh, has been played by many, many great actresses that I'm sure you knew probably growing up in high school, reading The Glass Menagerie. Mm -hmm. Do you have to throw out any preconceptions you have of Laura Wingfield when you take the role on yourself? Something that's so lucky for me is that I never saw a production. Oh. I read it in high school, I read it again in college, and I remember for my audition, I asked John Tiffany, the director, what's your concept for the piece and like, what do you think about her? And he was like, just great actors in the play. <laughs> and I thought, well that, let, lets me off the hook a little bit. And you, Cherry, I mean, have you seen uh, Amanda's before in your I've, uh, I've seen it probably more than any play. Really? Yeah. Mm. Uh, and because I, uh, Julie Harris was a dear right, friend. That, you know, I had a friend up in Syracuse stage in the late 70s. Who, you know, I, I kept seeing productions of it. But I, I was never sold on the play. Why? It was just so grim. It didn't feel familiar to me. Hmm. And part of that is because I was blessed, as you said the other day, to come from a highly functional family. <laughs> right, uh, right, right. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have to worry about my next meal ever. Right. You know, I, we all study the Great Depression, but until you've been in that situation, you can't begin to imagine it really. Right. And if you get turned off to something early enough, which I did in high school, it just didn't resonate with me for all of these reasons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I auditioned for Laura many times, and I never got it, because I'm a rather large, big-boned girl. <coughs> and um, uh, but, but John Tiffany, we met one day through a mutual friend up in Cambridge over two years ago now mm -hmm. uh, at Veggie Planet. And, Love. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it was, uh, we were cleaning out, my sister and I were cleaning out our family home because right. our parents had died. And I guess my... As I talked about it, my accent dropped further and further south. <laughs> and he looked at me and he Good. said, we're going to work together and we're going to do the Glass Menagerie. And I said, John, we are definitely going to work together, but we will never do the Glass Menagerie. <laughs> what turned <laughs> it around for you? Do you still find the play grim? Well, he just, well, I don't now mm -hmm. because, again, of Mr. John Tiffany. He did make it completely new. Mm -hmm. And, and got rid of all those things that Tennessee would be mortified. I think he was a young playwright. Right. He and was he was he's overdoing <clears throat> it. And, and sometimes in this, as great as the Glass Menagerie is, you do sometimes feel, all right, the poetry is beautiful, but there's, there's too much. You, you, know, you pull back, as he learns to do later on in Streetcar and, and, and Cat on the Hot Tin Roof. Any your thoughts on, um, do you find this play grim? Did you? Oh, I, it did not speak to me either as a young person. Because you're from a functional family. From, and Detroit, Michigan, I, where I just felt like, I don't know <laughs> what, it felt very Southern and very dysfunctional. That comes across yeah. very clearly in this production is, as you, you touched on this, Sherry, is the, um, the desperate financial straits yes. of the family. You know, you think of Laura 
you know, just as I remember the play, well, you know, she wants Laura to be with a man. But Laura has to be with a man because if she's not, she's going to be poor and broke. And this family and is on the verge. And she's tried. She's tried business college. I think also Tennessee Williams is an underrated feminist writer. I actually believe that he writes for women, particularly women. I mean, Blanche, <clears throat> excuse me, and Amanda, these are women who are thrust into crazy social circumstances right. and have had to survive on their own. And what's so amazing about what Cherry's doing is that she lets you see all of that. It's not just this narcissistic mother. Right. It's a woman who's trying to exist in a world that is deeply difficult right. and, and, and trying to help these children survive. And the other thing, I found myself on your side, because in, in the past looking at the play, I always thought, oh, Tom is a victim of the mother, the mother. No. But then you see it from your perspective. He's not helping the family. Part of the problem is he did abandon a family who needed him. Yes. You yeah. know, and, and it was an impossible situation. The three of them in this tiny yeah. little cramped apartment, these yeah. two grown children and this overbearing mother who wants them to succeed, these right. children who are so alien to her in every way. I don't even think she's that narcissistic. I, I think she is so fixated on this child's future. Mm -hmm. And all of the references to the past, but in the first place, they're the only references she has. Right. And <clears throat> what you find is, because she is, what you find is at the end of every one of those references, it always goes back to him, the father. Right, that's right, that's right. You know, I could have had all of this, but I picked him. him. That's right. I could have, you know, right. the jonquils, 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 and then I met him. Mm -hmm. She is still so madly in love. Well, you but know, they but do have, they do have this perspective where every time that she keeps mm -hmm. interpreting Laura in terms of herself. I mean, you say she's not narcissistic, and yet when she gets on the dress and she's so fixated on her past and really sort of oblivious to Laura's reality. But you can also argue that she has truly no other dress, and for her, <laughs> she, she doesn't. She could yeah. argue as, that. As ludicrous <laughs> as it is, yeah. what she's trying to do is present herself in a way that says to that young man, you have entered a home of noble dignity That's and right. worth. It may look meager, yep. but we are people of quality. And this struck me too when you <clears> said, and then I met him, the father, her husband, because I was struck by um, the great line at the end of Long Day's Journey into Night when Mary Tyrone says, and then I met James Tyrone, and I was happy for a while, which is like, what, what, what these men do to women in American <laughs> literature, <laughs> Celia? Often seems to have a lot to do with alcohol. <laughs> right. I want to ask you, you are working um, uh, with really one of the great the great actresses. Can you give us a sense? Pretend Cherry isn't here. Uh, what are you? What are you studying? What are you looking at? What are you absorbing? I oh mean, you're my getting, god! Are you sort of master class in. Of in, course, in <laughs> of course. I mean, part of the whole reason, because I didn't really care for the Glass Menagerie, the main reason I wanted to be in it was because Cherry Jones yeah. was in it, um, and I've just, I mean. Cherry Jones is who Cherry Jones is for a reason. She is beloved and respected because she's the genuine article. I mean, that's just the truth. Mm -hmm. And particularly because I'm from musicals, I think I have, we have very different processes, though they're super compatible, I would say. Yeah. And I have learned so much about detail mm. and working from the inside out. I think when you're from musicals, you're so process oriented that I'm really facile and probably a little too fast for my own good that I could, and watching Cherry has just been. Who is slower than molasses. She <laughs> said <laughs> that, she is not that slow. It, it's true, it takes me forever. In Boston, I was still just struggling with the lines. The things that came out of my mouth one night. <laughs> that is true. It is, that is true. I mean, these, these three, they didn't know what they were going to come up against <laughs> with. I mean, I will say on Broadway, I am, I am almost every night letter perfect now. I truly yes. am. Every if, and, or but. But in Boston, my favorite was when I say to, to Tom, I say, honey, you go ask sister if supper's ready. You know, sister's in full charge of supper. Tell her you hungry girls are waiting for it. <laughs> 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 Whoops! <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to say was, as, as you asked her that, that question about me, the thing is, the four of us bonded immediately. 
and and we all have we all have chops yeah and there and and I would argue at the same level I have more experience because I've been doing it for 35 years but right. we all have chops and this is this is a, a group of, of professionals blessed with a tremendous love of what we do. To get four people, and I also think, again, it goes back to John Tiffany. And, and you're with he, Zachary Quinto. And, and Brian. And Brian J. Smith. Yeah. Sorry, boys. Yes. <laughs> we are like a family, as cliched as it sounds. And that time in Boston when you have no life, it was the dead of winter. Right. We would go home to Zach's apartment every night and just talk about the play, about life. And so and by the time- And love on his two dogs, which yes. are always good out of town. <laughs> and we just, so that when we got to New York, starting rehearsals, we did just like nine days of rehearsals in the rehearsal room. We were so comfortable mm -hmm. with one another and the amount of trust I think that we had in what we were doing and in each other, it was just, and we it's just heaven. been dying to get back to it. Right. We would text and email all summer long <laughs> saying, having fun, having a good summer, doing this, doing that. Do you know How your lines, you? Jerry? How are you? <laughs> well, that's, I tell you, <laughs> speaking of that, because we closed St. Patrick's Day right. in Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> Always a fun day. And, and uh, which gave me six months. Right. And I, you better believe, I ran those lines <laughs> at least twice a week. And it was so wonderful because when we f when we finally got back into New York yep. it was so in me I don't have to think right but right. you better believe I'll run them today before I go do it tonight <laughs> I, I, I just because I just because it's a lot she never shuts up no she doesn't and you really have arias I mean real arias there uh, throughout the whole place or as John would call them narias <laughs> non-arias non <laughs> it's a terrific production of um, uh, Glass Menagerie at the Booth Theater starring uh, uh, Celia Keenan Bolger as Laura Wingfield and uh, Cherry Jones as Amanda Wingfield don't miss it uh, I think it'll be with us for a long long time thanks a lot for being our guest thank, thank you, you. you. pleasure I don't know of anything more tragic than a young girl just putting herself at the mercy of a handsome appearance, and I hope that Mr. O'Connor is not too good looking. As a matter of fact, he isn't. His face is covered with freckles. He's got a very large nose. He's not right down homely. No, I wouldn't say right down homely. Medium homely, I'd say. <laughs> So, Michael, we have our good friend, one of the unsung heroes of the theater. Yes, press agents are a very, very important part about how the whole Broadway jungle works. You probably know Sidney Falco. In the, uh, <laughs> one in of the, our role models. One of your role models. Thank you, Michael. In, in, the, great, in the great movie Sweet Smell of Success. Shoot me now. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, she, she bears no resemblance at all to Sidney Falco. Thank you. Straight above board, honest. I've been dealing with Susan Shulman for years uh, on the other side of the uh, of the table as we often mm -hmm. have sparred over various things over the years and she has taken us backstage literally backstage in her new book backstage past to broadway true tales from a theater press agent welcome to theater talk thank you it's very all right, exciting Susan, uh, all right let's um let's start dishing right away shall we? <laughs> you worked uh at the end of his glorious career with the great producer david merrick i did and can you give us a sense of just going into a meeting with David Merrick at the end of his life. Well, let me preface this by saying that I grew up on David Merrick shows. I mean, I saw Fanny and Carnival and Stop the World and Hello from, Dolly and all. Hello that. Dolly for I mean, I grew up on David Merrick shows. So the first time David Merrick came to my office was big stuff. Yeah. That was pretty big. Mm -hmm. And that was the good news. The bad news was that by that time he'd had a serious stroke and he couldn't walk or talk. So, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> other than that, it, no. But I mean, he was sort of in there. He, he. There were times when you felt absolutely that he was with us and he was communicating in some way, or pointing, or thumping, or whatever he was doing to to make a point. Mm -hmm. And there were other times when you felt he wasn't. So it was a very peculiar uh, setup. Right. And of course, I went into this knowing all the stories about David Merrick and all the you know that you know people. Some people loved him, and a lot of people didn't love him. People feared him, and people feared him, and so. It was, um, it was a very weird situation to be in mm -hmm. because on one hand it was David Merrick, it was this titan, mm -hmm. and he had certainly, certainly knew far more than anybody else in the room. On the other hand, he wasn't always a participant. You were a doing State Fair then, right? This was during State Fair, which started as a Theater Guild production right. and was really never intended to come to Broadway. It was intended to be another string in the Rodgers and Hammerstein 
bouquet of shows. Right. But it did really, really well on the road, and people loved it. It was like comfort food. People yeah. just loved State Fair. I remember it being a charming production, but it was the thing dear. was that it was uh, it all the, the whole story became about Merrick. Well, and the Merrick nonsense and insanity. Which when, tell us what was going on. Well, what happened was that the the people that were really behind all of this, which was which was the Theater Guild and some other people, wanted to kind of recreate. Merrick's heyday when he was very much um, a troublemaker. I mean, he loved to take on his adversaries just as you do, Michael. Thank you. And he would <laughs> a he pot would, stir. He was he was stirring the pot. And so we one of the things we did, which was really without Merrick's participation, in all honesty, was we created a, a campaign um, that were memos from Merrick, mm. and they were kind of snarky and tongue in cheek, and they kind of made fun of other shows that were on Broadway. And, and you put those in advertisements in the newspaper. They were New York Times ads. And we used this old photo of Merrick in his heyday with his, you know, hat on his, you know, angled and his gold tip cane. And I mean, it was, it was great. And what nobody really picked up on was that he really wasn't involved. He wasn't writing memos. <laughs> he wasn't writing the memos. <laughs> yeah. And he wasn't really, I don't even know if he saw them, actually. Mm. But they were fun and they were snarky and they were kind of, you know, yeah. giving everybody a little zits yeah. and uh, people wrote about it because it, it, they were fun. Right. When you say there was still a little of the old Merrick left though, what did mm -hmm. you see specifically in him? Was there any moment or well, something that he did that uh, you thought that is the great man I'll still I'll tell you, if, if ever there was somebody who knew about billing, it was David Merrick. <laughs> and one of the, at the very first meeting I had with him, yeah. I had created two layouts, two uh, uh, billing pages for State Fair, and it was at a time when Merrick and, and, his, and his companion had come into the show, and she was billed as a, I think, as a co-producer. Natalie uh, Lloyd. Natalie Lloyd. And so David and, and Natalie came to my office, and I presented them each with the two different A and B. Right. And one was, in my opinion, a much stronger placement of her billing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the proverbial box, you know, right. it wasn't, but, but it was... David the, Merrick presents in association Well, that with, part was, yeah. that was all set. That was very much. It was, it was David Merrick Presents, the Theatre Guild production of Rogers and Hammerstein State Fair. There were a lot of words up there. But, <laughs> but Natalie's billing was, was the particular issue at that day. And so I, present, I presented Mr. Merrick and Natalie both with two versions of the, of the billing page. And he looked at them and he immediately went, this one. And she looked at them and because he said A, she picked B. Just, just I think that was the nature of their relationship. It was very kind of adversarial in an in, in interesting way. And in the end, she won, which was interesting because she didn't win, you right. know, because in fact, his, what he had indicated was, was the better. But you better. as the press agent are in no position to... Uh, Not up to no, me. Nope. No. The thing that most impresses me about a good press agents mm -hmm. is their diplomacy in the face of some very difficult egos. It's a challenge. It is a challenge. And I have to say, Writing this book is very interesting for me because I'm someone that has spent my entire career making other people look good. Mm. That's my job. My job is to make sure that, you know, everything is in place and that you know what the situation is and you know who you're being interviewed by and you know what the pros and cons are and you know. And for me to be the one in the spotlight after all these years is very odd <laughs> and a little bit uncomfortable. Welcome to the hot seat. I know. <laughs> it's not... It's not an interest. It's a very interesting transition. Well, I always thought though a press agent's job is is doubly difficult because you've got to deal with the client, mm -hmm. a David Merrick or a Lauren Bacall. You've mm -hmm. worked, you know, you've worked with all the greats. But well, on the other hand, you have to deal with the, equal, Michael Riedel. Michael Riedel. Diva, diva esque people like the press. Yes, this is true. the Michael Riedels of the world. And back, you know, when you were beginning, I mean, the, those big columnists like Liz Smith mm -hmm. and um, Earl Wilson and, and That's these right. people. I mean, we are divas in our own right. So you have yes, to juggle. You are. <laughs> <laughs> of all, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the columnists that you dealt with. Um, who, which columnist of all did you did you like back in back in uh, in your day? Who had the most? In my day, <laughs> my day is still <laughs> here. Thank my God, I'm still doing it. So well, I mean, but, Thank you. but the Broadway newspaper well, column is kind of dead. I'm the, I have the only one left. But when you they, were starting up, they were all over the place. They were all over the place. And the interesting thing was that everybody, there were there were column guys that spent their entire day crafting column items specifically for. Earl Wilson, or specifically for Ed Sullivan, or whoever else. Yeah. Those were the two when I was first starting, and, they, and believe me, they didn't talk to me. I was, you know. Yeah. Um, but Leonard Lyons, too, right? Leonard Lyons. I actually grew up with Leonard Lyons' son. But um, those columnists had their own style, as you do. They, they had a particular way of 
writing, like Cindy Adams, you know, has a kind of style. And, and so there were guys that spent all day, that's all they did, in the Bill Dahl office, which was the first press office I started, worked yeah. in, who was one of the grand old men of the press, uh, press agent. And they would run the way those guys in the press office had written them. each one was exclusive, so you never sent the same item to somebody else until you got it. And Oh, and they would all send it back if they weren't going to use it. You huh. would get it back the next day. So you could s sell then, it to somebody else. And then else. you could rewrite it for the next column or another column. This when did you start meeting some of these people? When do you rise up uh, as a press agent for the well, ranks I where you actually get to I, meet I, Mr. Lyon? I Mr. think as, as you, you know, begin to have your own office and you begin to be a little more of a grown-up right. press agent, you right, know, right, you right. And, uh, did graduate. You, did you, did you I like all you. these guys? I met you. Well, we met at Leslie Warren, which we'll get to it. <laughs> did you like all these guys or were there any of them who were really sort of imperious the way we think of um, uh, J.J. Hunsecker in Sweet Smell of Success? Were there anyone like just I a, never, loved to exercise their no, power? No, I don't think, I think that day was long gone by the time I came into the picture. I mean, I really don't think, I think it was much more of a collaboration. Between the press agent yeah. and the... Yeah, and, th and I think it still is. I mean, I've said this before, but I think we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that way about critics. I feel that way about journalists. I think we're all in this together. Now, remember, Susan, always tell the truth. This is true. All right. I, this, is, this is one of my <laughs> Well, Susan and I first met because you were uh, uh, repping um, the Johnny Mercer uh, show, Dream. Dream. Right. And the Which star is really, uh, there's a chapter in this book that's really the Michael Riedel chapter. I know. Thank you very yes. much. I, mm -hmm. I, I certainly read that part. Um, <laughs> and we met. I was memorized. I was probably. a young, uh, you know, scrappy little reporter there at the Daily News. Mm -hmm. And Leslie Ann Warren was the star of Dream. She was. And I began sort of picking up rumblings that she was... As if by wizardry. <laughs> right. <laughs> that she was uh, difficult and very weird. Not through me. No, because that would be the last thing you did. Oh, yeah. my God. Well, no, I think the thing I called you, you on... You had a mole. You had a good mole in that company. Oh, I had a lot of moles. I'm sure you did. And didn't she, like, she hated a chair or a sofa, and she just <laughs> one day walked up to it, and she rip, ripped it. Well... And that's what I called you. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> here's the thing. Sometimes actors get in their own way. And, you know, they're, they're talented, they're beautiful, they're, ta you know, they have a lot going for them. But there's some actors that get in their own way, is, is a polite way of saying it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think she's one of them. I think she's somebody that, you know, you look at her and you think, well, why isn't she a huge star? She's she was beautiful. Beautiful, like, talented, yeah. she can sing, she can act, you know. And, and I think that there's, there's other parts to the picture that maybe the public doesn't always see. And in that show, some of that behavior you brought out to the public. So what do you do when a uh, columnist such as myself calls and say, hey, Susan, I hear your star is behaving badly backstage. The cast hates her. She ripped the sofa <laughs> up. She's impossible. I mean, when you get that call, what, what does your blood chill well, for a moment? Yes, what, what it do does. It does. <laughs> and you think, oh, my God, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And in this case, obviously, you did have a mole in the company, and, and the reports were correct. And unfortunately, some of that behavior was done in front of, 20 or 30 people. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, I'm not going to lie because, you know, she did it. And if she did it and people told you, uh, there's no point in denying it. You and, know? and also, beyond you being an ethical person, you can't lie to somebody like Michael because then he... You then the relationship well, between the, the, the exactly. reporter and the president is Exactly. You're not going to trust me. Exactly. And, but on the other hand, I, I, I think I did say to you, oh, Michael, it must be a very slow news day if you'd want to write about this. <laughs> Listen, that's one of the, Surely there's something more <laughs> those interesting. Those are one of the columns that made my career, darling. That's I know. I make my I living on bad behavior from I, Diva's I, backstage. I always said that I think Dream was your favorite show. I love Dream. so many was, interesting it was a dream things went on. Through, if you, now, do you when, when I call with information uh -huh. like that, do you have to go to the star? Did you have to go to Leslie's dressing room and say, uh, Michael Riedel of the Daily News mm. is going to write a column that's going to cast you in an unfavorable... No. How do you handle that? No, I mean, what happened was I did talk to the producers and they were aware of it, but, but it, it happened. And it happened in front of a lot of people. And so it happened. Very quickly, um, of all the great stars that you work with, do you have a particular <laughs> favorite, somebody that you really just... Mary Martin. Why? She was magical. I, I, I started as a, a kid. I was a fan. I stood outside stage doors waiting to see her, not wanting her autograph. I wanted to tell her how she enhanced my life. And um, eventually, the fandom turned into two professionals in the business. She was very generous and kind to me. And at, towards the end of her life, I had an opportunity on a radio show, a live radio show, to kind of rescue her and to pay her back in, a, in some small way for her kindness to me. Because her mind was a little... No, 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 no. Somebody said something rude oh. uh, on a live radio show. It About was when she was doing Do You Turn Somersaults in, at, at the right. Kennedy Center. Yeah. And I had an opportunity to sort of save the day. Not No, she was fine. It was, it was saving an awkward moment. 
and I, I was so grateful because I had a chance to some, in a teeny little way, pay back to somebody that I had really idolized my whole life. Uh, the show, uh, the, the show. The, the show, the It's going to be a show. It could be adapted into a show. Who knows? Backstage pass to Broadway, true tales from a theater press agent. If you love uh, the sweet smell of success and showbiz <laughs> and the old columns, uh, and, this is the book for you. And, and it's full of good advice, mm -hmm. including at the end you say, I don't believe all publicity is good publicity. Sometimes we just need to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> just what I wanted to ask you about some other people you ran around with back in the day. All right, Susan Schulman, the book is Backstage Pass to Broadway True Tales from a Theater Press Agent. Oh, zero Mustel stories you won't believe. <laughs> exactly. Hair raising zero Mustel stories. Thanks for being a guest tonight. Thank Talk. you. You can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can follow us on Twitter. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.